Our whole world has opened up. The whole world is now a market of opportunity, which means we need to make choices. And I have four spectacular speakers with us on stage that I'm delighted to have. They're looking at me a little nervously because I told them that all the questions that were on their briefing forms, I'm not gonna ask any of them. So we're going to get very personal because I want us all to understand not just what they do brilliantly, but who they are what they fundamentally believe, because this is about the choices of the future world of tourism that we're going to make today that are going to shape the industry for generations to come. So I'm delighted to have sitting beside me Faraz Farouki, who's the managing director of Cruise Saudi. Sir, wonderful having you with us. We also have Ashish Sangrajka, who's the president of five, Big Five Tours and Expeditions. Thank you for joining us. Olivier Granit, the chief executive officer of Casada Capital. Sir, thank you. And my dear, dear, dearly loved friend, Nikolina Anglakova, the former minister of tourism of Bulgaria. Madam, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm sure you're going to find as well that all of our voices on the stage are probably an octave lower than they were <laughs> yesterday, and our eyes a little bit redder, but, we're looking at the future of tourism. We're looking at new and emerging source markets. We have a world of opportunity. We have a world of choices. I want to get an understanding of what they're saying yes to, but also what they're saying no to. But to start, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you this. How do you define growth? How do you define growth? How do I define growth? So growth to me is when you give other chances they, uh, to grow and to perform and to uh, do things they were not able to do. And let me give you an example. Uh, when we launched uh, the cruise business or the cruise industry in Saudi Arabia, when MSC came in 2021, we had a program with local universities that would allow Saudi male and female interns to go and work on the ship for three months. And one of the trips I went to meet the captain. And all of a sudden, the captain said, let's wait for five minutes because I want to make the daily announcement you know, of the weather, where we're heading, and all that. So he made the announcement. And then uh, the, there was a Saudi female intern who was 19 years old who made the announcement in Arabic. And, the ca and just looking at her face when she was making that announcement and the pride she had, that's what I define as growth. That's a beautiful starting point. How do you define growth? So I define growth by storytelling. Every country has an inflection point where the story starts. It's not when they gained independence. It's not when they generated income. It's when the story started. My mother's from Sudan. My parents are from Kenya. I am from Kenya. I just watched my uncle become a refugee a month and a half ago in Sudan. So to me, looking at a place like Sudan and saying, look, one day, and what gave me hope was seeing the, the delegate from Ukraine here. And I told her how much courage it took for her to be here. To me, that's how you define growth. Every country has an inflection point. I worked very closely, I'll give you an example, with the Colombian Tourist Board. We were one of the first companies to open up in Colombia in 2006, when everybody thought it was crazy to go there. And we worked with them to help tell their story, embracing what happened like Rwanda did. But being able to say, this is where our story started. It's not when we were occupied, not when we gained independence, but when we actually realized that tourism was more important than the cartels. That's how I define growth. How well can we tell that story? And it's interesting you mentioned that, because I remember when you did the massive burning of all the ivory, mm -hmm. and it was Honorable Minister Balala at the time who made the point of, I think it was that the value of an elephant is 70 ti 72 times more, 70 something times more, alive than the value of the ivory That's when right. they're killed. That's exactly and it was right. amazing to have that, that, that sound bite so people understood if we're going to grow the industry, we genuinely have to protect it, which is and, an important point. And stand behind it, right? Once they make a decision, and this is what Colombia did so well, committing to it no matter what, no matter what comes in the way, never wavering from that message. Brilliant. Nicolina, please. Well, growth for me is also to create opportunities and to give 
others, not only from the sector of tourism, but other sectors in the country to join you and to make them believe that tourism is something that creates values, gives opportunities for all people and really engage the society. And when country like Bulgaria, which is a small jewelry in Europe, will be able to attract attention and to uh, really welcome more uh, visitors with a qualified product, then that means growth because you engage the entire society. And it grows is not only about numbers, but it's about, in tourism in particular, to, uh, I agree with the Shish with storytelling, but to create really experience and to, to be the one, the, the unique one with a, a own tailor-made story that then to be spread mouth to mouth with, with uh, all the friends around. That's, that's close, to engage at all and to create opportunities, this is for me. Stunning, thank you, please. Um, growth has to be sustainable and inclusive. As, as investor on the African continent, for us since day one, it's our commitment is to demonstrate that we need to have a business model which is working, meaning profitable and, and, and sustainable, but it doesn't work if at the same time it's not about uh, <clears throat> all the commitment in terms of creating an ecosystem where we, we, we give more than we take and how we, do, we promote local talent. So we have a number of KPIs about having 80% of our GM as a local talent, the gender parity, the local communities, the uh, energy efficiency of the building. And this is fundamental for us. So growth means that you invest, you put your skills, your energy, your passion, your love, and, and then you expect, uh, I'm strongly believe here, an amazing return. I must say, there's one thing I'm enjoying about what you've just responded on is there's a richness in your articulation of what growth is that I don't believe we had three years ago. It feels as if, and it's interesting that just again, your, your body language saying that, because equally, as much as we as tourism practitioners have shifted in our understanding of the value of the industry, so have the travelers. So when we talk about understanding new and emerging markets, it, we, it is our risk and huge at our peril if we just blow off the dust from our business plans and our policies from three years ago. From each of your perspectives, how do you understand the travelers have now changed in their definition of the value of traveling compared to what it used to be? Michalina, please. Well, the travelers has changed dramatically, I think, after COVID in particular, now when the world reopened. And they are more cautious about sustainability, what the uh, properties are offering, I mean, the hotels, the resorts, they're looking for something that is eco-friendly, environmentally good. Also, um, safety is very important. It's like we, were, we used to take safety like a given, but now after COVID, everybody in this industry understood that they need to invest in that. Of course, with A1 coming on the stage, um, Artificial intelligence has to be, it has, must have its own place within the marketing, new marketing strategies. And I, I do believe that each country has a unique selling point to offer with his history, uh, heritage, um, traditions, everything that is important to attract more visitors. And visitors are becoming more demanding in terms of more particular personal approach towards each traveler. Mass tourism is not anymore something that would attract the traveler towards a country. And this also now is a discussion in Bulgaria to shift in some of the resorts from the all-inclusive concept to the bed and breakfast one only, the not mass, uh, as I said, avoiding mass tourism, which is of course related to what I said in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, uh, healthy and safety precautious measures and which of course relate to the new digital, more digital approach towards um, marketing the destination and using new technologies. Absolutely and to your point they're looking for it and they're demanding and action on behalf of whether it's the products or the destination itself. Olivier from your perspective. Um, this is very much connected to the story yesterday from Juliette on, on when she arrived and and, and, and a connection with the, the 
<coughs> the, the young people that was driving here, which means that this is the combination of the future, the, the tech, the, the, and, and, and there is a very strong appetite for that. And at the same time, to be connected to uh, the roots, the past, and where we are coming from. And it means that authenticity uh, is uh, really the, the, the key uh, expectation. So this lifestyle, boutique hotel, on how you are in your culture, you are uh, engaging with others, you have the experience, uh, but at the same time in a certain environment where uh, yeah, the, the, the true connection uh, can exist. And uh, I, I believe that's today something which is easy to say, to deliver as hotel investor, hotel operator, uh, you have some challenge with that, but that's really uh, where uh, are the expectations from the travelers. Indeed. And you raise a very important point because ours is an industry that is very blessed to have the opportunity to find the balance between mm. the tech and the touch. Mm. Because it is about the human connection yeah. that is then enabled mm. through putting the technology mm. there to get the scale, the speed, etc. Who else from your perspective? I think uh, from what I've been hearing, three things people are demanding more and more of. It's first culture, and we saw the recent report by Sky, Skyscanner where they said 54% of people want to go to a place because of the culture. Second thing that I'm hearing also more of is nature. They want to be in the nature, they want to, uh, even if they're within a big city like Riyadh and Saudi Arabia, they still want to go to the desert out there. And third, which was like, this is becoming more and more what I'm hearing from people is the energy of a place. So if you go back to Saudi Arabia, I, I think these are the three aspects where Saudi Arabia has to offer to people. So first, on when it's the place itself, the nature, we have beautiful mountains and we have pristine beaches. And the second thing is culture. And the way we define culture is like the UNESCO defines it with 16 subsectors from the traditional ones like language and theater and arts all the way to the new uh, sectors like fashion, culinary arts and architecture. And third, when you talk about energy, that's becoming very interesting because people, so for example, when they come to Riyadh, they say there is an energy of you know, just doing things, of uh, the whole country on a mission. Whereas if, when they go to an Ula, it's, a, it's an energy of serenity, it's of, of relaxation, of connection with the universe. So these are the three things that I'm seeing more uh, from uh, the travelers post-COVID that they want to focus on. And I love the, your point about people are wanting to feel that energy. They're wanting to be infused by and be a part of that energy. Ashish, what are you finding? So Matthew's lovely wife, Jessica, talks about the conscious comeback, which I agree with wholly. That's what travel is looking for. You, you know, you, you talked about the last two years or the, the two years in the pandemic. I would argue that although our you know, businesses were decimated, it was the best two, two years that could have happened because it allowed us and forced us to redefine everything we thought we knew. It allowed us to approach everything from a new way. And, and we've been talking about sustainable tourism you know, for years. What does it mean, right? So well, clients now want that as well, but they want us to define it. And it can't just be, okay, well, we're carbon offsetting, which is great, or that we are conserving, or that we are rescuing, or we are feeding, dot, dot. Those are all great. There's got to be more to it. So I go back to the inflection point. Case in point, we were listening to all the stories about Rwanda and listening to everything else here. I've been coming here for years. My wife's family is from Uganda. So I've been coming here for years. And what you heard on stage here, the gorillas were mentioned maybe once, twice. We talked about the genocide museum more. You're talking about local and, and, and what we're feeling. That's what's key. People want to be part of that story. They want to be transformed. I just came from back from Peru with a group of, of travelers, and we were up in the very northern part of Peru with the, you know, the, one of the highest freestanding waterfalls in the world. The people that were there with me, I watched them transform. We took them to Machu Picchu on the second day, and I told them very clearly, we're going here to get it out of the way because we're going up here because there's something more. And I watched their attitude change. People want to be transformed. They don't want to come back and say, I had a great time. They want to come back and say, it was fantastic. If they go on safari, for example, whether it's in South Africa, Kenya, or Tanzania, that lion is going to look the same no matter who you go with. It's what happens in between those experiences that actually transforms who they are, where they come back and look at life differently. 
That's what I, that, that's really what clients are looking for. And it's a lovely point you make because it's as much as we say that we go and travel and discover the world, we discover ourselves right. in that process. And I was saying to Matthew last night that when he came up and he made that spectacular announcement about the SME initiative, there were times when it felt like he was choking a little bit about how this continent has impacted him. Uh, and it, it's true, it's the transformation that you take with you for the rest of your life. And what's been important as well about the last thousand days, this is where governments, and you know it exceptionally well, Nicolina, to open up domestic tourism was brilliant. It was always the poor cousin of the industry, but it allowed us to bring up the baseline. It allows us to break that seasonality issue. And when you marry that with regional, then you top it up with international, you have a solid model. But the question is, now that we have all these choices, we have the foundations in place of the principles of what is growth. Now you need to choose who you are going to invite into your country. You are a perfect example, sir, of a destination where curiosity is inspiring action. And that's magic when you see, again, the transformation, not just of Saudi in the last eight years, in the last 10 years, and congratulations on the 2034 World Cup. I'm not sure if everyone's heard, but Saudi's going to be hosting the FIFA World Cup in 2034, spectacular. You've made choices about how you are opening up. How do you choose? And then I'm gonna to go to Nicolina following that. From the point of view of governments, how do you choose? To whom do you set out that invitation? And then, who next? Can you share some of the thinking, please, from the kingdom? So I used to, because I work closely with the Minister of Culture, I used to always get uh, filmmakers from Hollywood, they want to they make a movie about Saudi Arabia, and they want to entice me, and they say, why don't we make a Netflix movie, or, or this movie, or that movie? And I, I always tell them, we don't want to make that movie. We want people to come and experience it, and then word of mouth would be enough. It's okay for us to wait for years, and you know, uh, and uh, and then people come one by one, and then they spread the word. I th and, and then once people come, they don't have much expectations, and they u are usually surprised by what they see. Uh, of course, in the past uh, four or five years since we opened tourism, a lot of people like have come, and uh, given the key. Uh, I don't want to call it the value proposition of the country, but given that we have an amazing nature and, and again, a, a very distinct culture and also the energy of the place, the kind of people who usually come are the ones uh, who are the forerunner of exploring a new country, a culture that hasn't been understood yet, a culture that's just opening to the rest of the world. Second is also the uh, these ecotourists who want to come and see nature as it existed thousands of years ago. They want to enjoy the beautiful water, go and enjoy the snorkeling in the Red Sea, and go enjoy all this nature in the north and Neom and the south. And third are these people who want to enjoy thousands of years old civilizations that existed, because we sit on a treasure that has been there for like thousands of years before Islam. Uh, key trade routes exist within Saudi Arabia from, so we had, for example, the instance route from south to north, from south to east, and there are at least 10 plus civilizations that we only uncovered five of which. And uh, these places are now, we're listing them on, on, the, on the UNESCO World Heritage Site, but they're yet to be uh, uh, developed. So, so the people who wanna be, part of this journey, these are the ones who we see coming to Saudi Arabia these days. And, and I think you're saying that people want to be part of the journey reinforces. Travelers know they have a choice of where they can make a positive impact, and they're making those choices in destinations. Nicolina, from your perspective, how would a Bulgaria look at making those choices of who they open the door to? Well, that's a very good question that I asked myself when in 2014 has to set up the Ministry of Tourism as a separate administration, actually. Uh, and at that time, we had 5.5 million international arrivals, 7 million population. And just before COVID in 2019, because I don't count 2020, we reached 9.4 million international arrivals and 27 million overnights. And for me, with a very little budget, for me, it's always important to have tailor-made approach for each country and for each group 
of uh, visitors for that country and to involve the local community. Like from the small farmer who produced the best, I could say, tomatoes in Bulgaria to make the very delicious salad, to the uh, craft, uh, craftsman that is really showing the culture and, and um, traditions in our country, through the singers. Bulgaria is actually in, has, uh, is third in Europe in terms of uh, discovered artifacts after Greece and Italy. UNESCO heritage that we have is rich. And it's less unknown also that Bulgaria is number second in terms of hot water natural springs after Iceland, more than 1,600. And to be able to spread that around is very important to engage everyone, regardless if they are directly involved with tourism or not, because the image of the country is what attracts the visitors. And it depends of all of us how we create those image of the country. And as I said, each country is unique with the heritage, with the culture, and how we give, we, we um, um, really make that uniqueness possible to be experienced by the visitors is the most important with the authenticity, sustainability, culture, people, because mainly people. Tourism is about people. Regardless of all the technologies that help us to uh, advertise and to market, tourism is about people. W when I go to a destination like here in Africa and in Rwanda in particular, I'm so impressed of the hospitality and the warmth of the people. When you see that smile, when you really uh, engage people to tell you more and you understand about the country for each and every person from each old perspective and you create your story and you want to come back. And it's not only about the animals that are here in Africa are beautiful and uh, you can't see in, uh, in any other way. But it's mostly about the people and the culture and the dances we experienced last night. And every single talk with each one in the room is what makes me really uh, very happy and gives me uh, the, the emotion, because tourism is also about emotions, to continue to create the individual storytelling from the Bulgarian perspective to attract more people to visit. And I think that, that that's a critical point that you're saying as well, because you, you live in a great neighborhood for yeah. regional tourism. I'm going to ask Ashish and Olivier, because we know that, again, regional, so from, a, from, a, from an Alula perspective, we know 70 to 80 percent of our market is GCC. So as much as we're marketing to the world, it's GCC that we rely on. How do we unlock the African continent? Because one of the greatest challenges for Africa's growth and development has been unlocking the African market for itself. As we now see the value and the values and appreciation for African travel by Africans now being much more than it ever was before, how do we unlock that? How do we make that work as a new and emerging market, Ashish? So it's starting already with connections between countries. You know, when I was growing up in Kenya, the definition of East Africa was Kenya and Tanzania. That definition has changed drastically because of the East Africa visa and now changed because of the waiver of visas between countries around Africa, where it now includes Rwanda, now includes Uganda. Now combining South Africa and East Africa has changed completely. It used to be a choice, which one comes first? Now Victoria Falls is the connecting point between two worlds. You're seeing this happening. This continent is getting so much foreign investment. You're seeing it in West Africa right now. It is because of natural resources, but it is also because of the inflection point of these individual countries. You talk to anybody who, who is telling their story from Senegal, for example, and, and telling their story about the colonial history in Senegal. You talk to anybody in, in Tanzania. Um, you know, I was in Arusha when uh, Her Excellency was sworn in. I heard her, her, her inauguration speech. What's lost on us is the fact that the only female president in the history of the country is now running the country and running it well. You know, the fact that the New York Times did a full cover story on her. When's the last time that happened? You're seeing it occur across the board in this continent. And, and I think it's attracting people, but what has to keep happening is connections. The private sector has to get involved with the public sector to create more connections, to create more economic diversity, and to create more collaboration between economies. You know, you're dealing with hyperinflation in several countries. Tourism, outbound and inbound, is a cure to hyperinflation. It is a cure to uh, creating a middle class in these countries. 
It is a cure to helping diversify some of these countries that are being, in some ways, manipulated because of natural resources. This is a way for them to speak up in a loud voice and say, no, this is ours. We want to share it with the world and do it responsibly. Indeed, and to your point, though, it's also keep it simple. Right. If we want to do that, we need the visas. That's we right. need the air connectivity because it can get the foundations in place. And your point is important as well because the univisa that exists between, I think it's Rwanda, Kenya, and Tanzania is beautiful because no one wants to do that once in a lifetime trip only once in their lifetime. Right. There's so much to see. Olivier, from your perspective, how do we unlock this incredible market literally sitting on our doorstep? Well, f f first of all, to look at the I mean, domestic regional market. So today we are investor in eight countries. We have six, around 65% of the guests based in the continent. And what we expect in the future is that 80% of our guests will be based on the continent. And then this is coming back to the point of air connectivity, visas, and uh, cost of transport that, that, that we need. Uh, but then the point is, what you, uh, just to reinforce the point of the partnership public-private sector, but to make it real, not only nice words, to see if we want to make it transformative, how we are working together uh, on something which is a journey and an experience. As, as a French, when I was in France a long time ago, uh, even with the number of visitors to France, you cannot imagine the number of meetings that we had with the, different, with the key stakeholders discussing with all the, the experience from arriving at the airport where uh, your taxi driver not speaking English, being a little bit rude, all of this was really uh, analyzed to see how we can have the lever and how we can work together on this. And then this is how we develop some very specific strategy. We have a flagship hotel in Cape Town where I strongly believe in the connection between African market and GCC. You mentioned GCC, where for me the, 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 the weak season is uh, during uh, some, uh, in the winter time, which is May, June, July, a little bit wet, not, the weather not great. But for people living in GCC, if you have Absolutely. 40 degrees plus, uh, my friends are telling, well, that's great, that's just what I'm looking for. So I'm, I'm sure that the more you work, we work together, public and private sector, the more we work together, different uh, countries, different continents, this is really the way to build the bridge. Right? Absolutely, and that there are two hands that need to clap. And to mm -hmm. your point as well, looking at the calendar, what is one destination's off-season isn't on for another, mm -hmm. and it's making sure that's there. A very interesting question that's come through, and I'm gonna see who's going to take this. Does the panel agree with the idea that you can never be successful in entering a new market unless you hire a leader from that market? If so, what is the role of the global executive in new markets? Who would like to take that? Well, I agree with that uh, statement because local uh, leaders, in particular in tourism, are very important to say what is the best that the country could offer and how, with common efforts, to make it, to make it tailored towards the visitors uh, that you would like to attract in your country. And um, it is important also um, to, as I said, fully engage the private sector together with the government and with the regional communities. For example, um, each country, each region has its beauty. Bulgaria, we divide it into nine regional uh, uh, touristic destinations where everyone was involved, including the universities and the schools, because people that are working in the sector must be very well educated to know what they're going to uh, say to the visitors and tourists. Because even if the governments and the owners uh, of the hotels and restaurants in the private sector, even if they're the best and they try to, to, do, to give the best service to the tourists, if the others are not well educated and they give different information, this will then say, I mean, I, in particular, if I'm given different information, okay, there might be something, what is here behind? Uh, and, and it gives immediately different feelings. So it's important to have the, to educate everyone and everyone to be on board. Of course, governments must be really um, responsible for uh, visa waiver. This is what she said uh, to edit on that and, and connectivity. I mean, we need 
to have a, a direct airline connections and other transport connectivity to uh, reach the, that country. But locals are the most important to help uh, in, in, and foreign investors and foreigners to create uh, um, a sustainable product that really tourists would love to have and to come back. Because the best proof that you have uh, a product that visitors like is when they come back with their friends and their families. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. they become loyal to the destination. Absolutely. And tapping into that insight. Ashish, well, to build on what Nicolina is saying, because she's exactly right, we went through this in Colombia. Certain countries, many countries, actually have rules where you have to have a, a, a local leader. We prefer it that way as well. What's the old phrase, right? You can, if you feed a person for a day, you'll feed them for a day. But if you teach them how to fish, they'll never go hungry again. We went through this in Colombia. My business partner in Colombia, his, he's Italian, but his family's from Venezuela. So showing up there, we're now in the process of putting boots on the ground in Venezuela because that's our next venture, to basically be able to say, look, there's a, a window opening here. But we need a local leader who understands idiosyncrasies. For example, if you don't have a presence in Cartagena, and you don't know how they work, then every time a cruise ship pulls in, your guide's gonna drop your assignment two weeks before your clients arrive. You have to have a presence there to understand how the guides there work. If you don't have a presence in Medellin, you don't understand how the hotels work there and the fact that they, there's no hospitality training, this is a still a city in transformation. So to exactly to your point, I can't do that. Somebody who's a global leader can't do that, but, but somebody who is a leader on the ground who understands that. But it's somebody who honestly doesn't have to come from tourism. My business partner is a former IBM programmer. And, and he, we opened up the office there together. The focus is on the fact that you understand the little idiosyncrasies in that country and then use that and teaching them what the definition of luxury means because that's also evolving. Indeed, and I think to your point, luxury need not have a price tag. Right. Because, I mean, to go on safari, the luxury is the stillness and the quiet not the Wi-Fi connectivity. Right. We're now down to our last three minutes, so now I'm gonna put in place my 30-second challenges. And I'm actually gonna ask yourself, because interestingly, cruise and Saudi are not two words one would normally think. Blue is not normally a color one would associate with the kingdom. Why is, strategically, is cruise Saudi so important to unlocking the destination as a whole beyond cruise? 30 seconds. Uh, so there were more than 100 cruise ships that used to pass by the Red Sea, and none of them uh, stopped in Saudi Arabia. So that's what we wanted to target. Uh, so that was one. The second thing was it's very important to market Red Sea as a destination, as a whole market, and not just Saudi Arabia. So connecting Saudi Arabia to Egypt, to Jordan, and a few other countries in the future. So I think that's what's important, and that's why we targeted the cruise. Indeed, and again, it's leveraging the value of that traveler. So for each of you, as we go into our last two minutes, 30 seconds, what do you see as the most exciting opportunity to unlock our industry from your perspective? Olivier. Um, well, we are talking of the fastest growing middle class population in the world. In industry which on the market is fragmented, underserved uh, with lack of international brand. We have 80% of the hotel owner of the 80% of the hotel on the African continent are owned by individual. You have 60% of the hotel with lack of international brand. So bringing the quality, the expertise, the sustainable criteria with the same level of quality what exists everywhere in the world is an amazing challenge, but this is really uh, for us a tremendous opportunity. Brilliant, thank you. Nicolina, 30 seconds. Well, the most important for me is to use the opportunity now to show that tourism is really important economic sectors because, sector, because the biggest challenge I had is, was to convince my prime minister and the other sectoral ministers that tourism is not only fun and to travel, but tourism is really important economic sector that engages the entire community and brings yes. a lot of value. This is the most important for me now to really build up on that Absolutely. all together. And by grounding us, Mother Nature taught everyone the value of that ecosystem. Ashish, Absolutely. 30 seconds. You know, it, it's basically helping these countries get back on their feet. Uh, in many cases, with some of these countries, tourism is the only sector that's working properly. There's sovereign debt issues in many of these countries. 
Rwanda is a case example of a success story. I, I tracked unemployment rates in countries during the pandemic, and in three months, unemployment rates in three separate countries went from 12.5% to 62% in three months. Helping these countries get back on their feet and growing back the right way and showing them that tourism can actually be a force for good to transform where they are no longer the world's factory. They are going to be part of the first world economically because they're contributing in a positive way in manners that even their local citizens would not always understand. Indeed. And sir, 30 seconds. What excites you? Uh, so I think it's uh, the possibility of, uh, uh, you know, that uh, our Minister of Tourism just uh, announced that we're going to have 100 million visits by 2030. That's a big challenge, but that also excites us. We are, we're very close to reach that number. And there are many new decisions that are opening in Saudi Arabia. I haven't seen them yet, so I need to go see them. I think the rest of the world need to go come and see them. And that's a challenge that we're excited about. Indeed. And so when it comes to opening up our industry and unlocking all these new markets, there is no better industry than tourism because it's unlocking the potential of a nation with pride, with hope, with participation, and with a conscious understanding of the fact that we can make a difference, which means the choices we make today are going to shape it for generations to come, so we need to make the right choices. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our lovely panel for the warm-up session.